Before the death of Trayvon Martin became a national story, Stand Your Ground had already become a big deal. First passed in Florida in 2005, the law is now on the books in some two dozen states. If you have followed the Trayvon Martin George Zimmerman story at all, by now you know that Stand Your Ground reinterprets self-defense to allow a citizen to use force, even deadly force, when that citizen feels threatened. But this is important. George Zimmerman's lawyers did not use Stand Your Ground as part of their case. Before the case even went to trial, there was so much talk about Stand Your Ground that this detail may have been lost. But in fact, Zimmerman's lawyers chose not to argue Stand Your Ground, and they didn't have to. Florida Circuit Court Judge Deborah Nelson essentially did it for them. Listen to the instructions she gave the six-member jury ahead of deliberation. If George Zimmerman was not engaged in an unlawful activity and was attacked in any place where he had a right to be, he had no duty to retreat and had the right to stand his ground and meet force with force, including deadly force, if he reasonably believed that it was necessary to do so to prevent death or great bodily harm to himself or another or to prevent the commission of a forcible felony. Yesterday, President Obama made it clear that he feels stand your ground laws need to be reconsidered and re-examined here in America. And for those who uh, who resist that idea that we should think about something like these stand your ground laws, uh, I just ask people to consider if Trayvon Martin was of age and armed, could he have stood his ground on that sidewalk? And do we actually think that uh, he would have been justified in shooting Mr. Zimmerman, uh, who had followed him in a car, because he felt threatened? More about other Stand Your Ground cases, also in Florida, after the break. Florida is where Stand Your Ground laws began eight years ago. And right now, a group called the Dream Defenders wants Stand Your Ground to end in Florida, specifically in Republican Governor Rick Scott's office. At this moment, the group, consisting of young and old, hailing from all over the state, is continuing its lengthy sit-in that began this week inside the Florida Capitol. Earlier, they were demanding to meet with Governor Scott, historically a supporter of the state's Stand Your Ground law, and Scott actually did take time to meet with the group on Thursday night, the third day of the protest. He still backed Stand Your Ground, but called for tomorrow, Sunday, to be a day of prayer for unity throughout Florida. The governor can meet the Dream Defenders at the Florida Capitol to pray because it's clear that those folks aren't going anywhere. So, Nina Turner, you said to me um, in the break, you're like, oh, yeah, it didn't quite start in Florida. It actually, Alec brought it to Ohio first. Oh, yeah. The, I mean, the bill just, well, it was just introduced in the Ohio House yeah. a couple of weeks ago, uh, Stand Your Ground in Ohio. And it just, it just baffles my mind that you have members who are elected to serve the people and create avenues of opportunity, but they use all of that political power to introduce bills like this. It is mm -hmm. just gut-wrenching. And, and we... Uh, I just want to show the audience the map, Please. Ari, of where Stand Your Ground is right now. Where because, is it? Yeah, because, yeah, you know, we were just talking about Stevie Wonder choosing not to play in these states. And, I mean, it, soon he will be just, like, hanging out in, in Duluth. <laughs> right, in, in Toronto. Uh, uh, Ari, when you look at this and when you see sort of this catching fire, what does this tell you about where we are right now? I think it tells you, number one, that we have a fascination with guns. Mm elevated well beyond anything that makes sense in our traditional criminal code. Mm -hmm. um, some members of the Republican caucus were talking about the verdict in this week's discussion mm -hmm. in the context of gun rights. Um, there, there is a right uh, to bear arms, uh, according to the Supreme Court, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. um, you also could argue that you have a right to liberty and to move around and to drive a car. Mm -hmm. The right to drive a car is not a right to vehicular homicide. Right. Right? It's pretty basic. So the right hmm. to have a gun in your home, particularly if someone comes at you or harms you or does uh, great bodily harm to your family, is quite different than running around the streets with mm -hmm. a gun looking for action, looking mm -hmm. for fights. Um, and we do know that, the pre just like in the domestic violence context, the presence of that gun more often than not creates more severe violence mm -hmm. rather than repels it. Mm -hmm. uh, there is not a great deal of evidence, particularly outside of the context of rural home invasion, mm -hmm. um, which, with all due respect to the rural areas and their own needs, is not the majority. Yep. Um, 
outside of that context, there isn't a lot of evidence of people in the streets using guns uh, to positive ends to avoid violence. Yep. Th this point is such an important one because you started with um, sort of our American national obsession with guns, the extent to which so many people are gun Again, live in Louisiana, guns are pretty... I grew up in a right. gun-owning house. Yeah, totally, totally ubiquitous. But it's also, it's the other piece, our obsession with fear yeah. mm -hmm. and the fear that there is this group, an identifiable group, yeah. that's going to come after us and our property and our home. Right. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, I think stand your ground would be problematic even if there was no racism or history of racism yeah. in the mm -hmm. country. But when you attach fear to color and race, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden that gets ramped up even more. And so now people who already had biases, maybe conscious, maybe subconscious about black folks and particularly young black men, now have a legal avenue above regular self-defense, which already existed, Castle Doctrine, etc. They have another avenue now by which to say, I was really, really afraid. And you have to ratify my fear because the law says I have the right to do this, really, if I perceive that you pose a significant threat to me. Objective facts don't matter. Subjective interpretation does. Right. That would always be scary. But when you have a country where fear is so connected right. to race, it makes and that, sense. And, 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 it instantiates that fear. It, it allows a jury to actually say your fear is the relevant fear right. here. Yeah, and that goes to how the legal framework of this works in most state law contexts, which is you can have a judge finding at the beginning of mm -hmm. immunity based on stand your ground, which mm -hmm. people who followed this case will remember didn't, was not ultimately asked for. Right. Uh, but then it comes back in in the jury instructions potentially, right? Yes. And that is where you're having a jury being told, well, here's how you can assess whether this was a justified mm -hmm. killing. Um, and I, do, I think the second degree murder charge was always difficult because of the mens rea, the mental elements you had yep. to prove. The, the, the uh, general you know, manslaughter charge, not as difficult, yep. doesn't go as much to mental state, yep. but... What you had was the jury assessing as a subjective mm -hmm. standard whether mm -hmm. this individual felt in his mm -hmm. mind or heart that he was under the kind of danger that necessitated force and didn't revolve, you know, didn't involve running away. Yep. Most people, and especially as we've been dis discussing in police interactions, most black men feel a desire to run away <laughs> from the threat of violence. Right. Yeah. Right. This is an instruction to a jury in these states often, and mm -hmm. jury instructions can be altered, so sure. I'm generalizing, mm -hmm. but it's a jury instruction that often results in the jury going, huh, well, did he feel threatened? Right, and which if is, he did. Which is very different. So one area yep. of reform is to say you need some kind of judicial finding at an objective level yep. of what works, yep. right? Because obviously, as you've, as you've been reporting from Rissa Alexander, her right. level of threat, right? It seems right. to me Not, that at a minimum, you could incorporate as a legal standard the yep. notion of the the prior threats from the mm -hmm. aggressor in the mm -hmm. situation. The, the existing stay away right. order. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. And, right. so, and so that goes beyond these individual cases and says, huh, if you have a woman who has yep. been attacked repeatedly, that might be a judicial <laughs> finding, which is different than a child who's never met this right. adult before. Sure. And the right. child is unarmed and the adult has a weapon. Christina, right. let, let me ask you one last question here. Part of what the president did in his discussion was to say, I'm not suggesting a big federal program. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, if we look at that map, we see that these are state laws. Stand your ground has been moving across the state. But I guess I wonder, is there a role in this moment for the federal government? Maybe not in the Zimmerman. I mean, you know, DOJ is going to decide about that. Mm -hmm. But is there a role for the federal government on the question of stand your ground laws? Or is this just such a state and local that we're never going to get there with a federal standard? I mean, uh, right. The laws are, there are, you know, state based. That is clearly the case. But I do think there is something more here. Right. Um, what we have, I, I feel I find it hard, I guess, to accept that we can show these numbers, we can show these disparities, and we can say, oh, well, right? That we can say there's no accountability, we owe nothing yeah. to this, that there's nothing that can be done to, to respond or correct this, right? Um, and and um, the president also talked about engaging, the, have the federal government in training mm -hmm. of local law enforcement, uh, yeah. right? right? And talking um, and engaging sort of the federal law enforcement with yep. local law enforcement around issues of race, implicit bias, yes. right? right? Um, and all these things. And I think that's critical. And the federal government absolutely needs to do that. And I think it has to go, though, beyond training mm -hmm. to accountability. Yeah. It's not enough to say we taught you how to do this right. We have to have something that says if we taught you to do it right and you're still doing it wrong, right. then, then you're accountable. Then, then there's accountability. Yeah. And you have to be held accountable for that. Absolutely. Yeah. And when only black men are, you know, are being killed yeah, and, right. and are not being allowed to assert mm -hmm. their right as citizens in this country mm -hmm. to self-defense, then there's something wrong. And we have to hold them accountable. There thank has to be accountability. Thank you so much, Christine. And also thank you to Tim, who's also going to come back and join us uh, tomorrow. Up next, my letter of the week.